Coming up there on YouTube land, Dan here from Geekcast Radio doing a very special video. This past weekend was Baltimore Comic Con, my favorite time of year, the best time of year in my opinion. Uh, my favorite Comic Con, really the Comic Con I've been going to for some time. Uh, this is about the uh, fourth or fifth year I've been able to go on a press pass due, due to Geekcast Radio. And uh, this week I'll have a lot of stuff coming out about Baltimore Comic Con. Uh, I'll be doing a blog post, we'll be doing a podcast with my fellow Talking in Circles members about Baltimore Comic Con, our comings and goings, some of the panels we went to, all that great stuff. But I thought, you know, one thing, the best part of going to a Comic Con, it's in the title, is the comics. It's getting the stuff. Yes, I love those panels. Yes, I seen, love seeing all the crazy cosplay, but you're also there to get stuff. So I thought I would have a comic book haul of everything I picked up. Uh, and I'm gonna split it up into kind of different sections because I think some people might be more interested in things than others, and I'll put time codes down below. I'm gonna be talking about some of the creator-owned stuff I got. I didn't get as much creator-owned stuff I, as I wanted to. I wanted to try to steer away from just getting back issues and things like that, but it, it was hard to kind of make room for it when you have Jim Steranko and Walt Simonson and Neil Adams and all these people in this place. It's hard to make time sometimes for the small, in the, publishers but I did pick up a few things which I'll go over. I also picked up a whole bunch of back issues uh, that I'll go over as well. Some older stuff, some of the older stuff I personally ever bought. Uh, some newer stuff, not as much newer stuff uh, but a lot of great variant covers when it comes to new stuff. I found I'm not a variant person cover type, type of guy. I don't buy two covers of the same comic. Typically I just get what I like, but there were some amazing deals on some comics that I'm like, hey, this is actually cheaper to buy the variant cover than I would to buy the regular cover, so I'll take advantage of it. That's really what I like the most, is getting a good deal on something, or feeling like I got a good deal on something. Maybe I didn't, I'm not sure. Um, so I'll put all that down below. Also, I got a lot of books signed from different creators that I'll be going over to show you what I got signed. Uh, that's always an adventure. That's always a, that's kind of cool to be able to kind of go around and talk to some creators. And that's the thing, a good thing I think about the comic book world that some of these people, they're very open and they'll have great conversations with you, uh, especially if you're bringing stuff that you got signed. So sometimes those conversations are more awkward than not, depending on the person. But this time around, like, I think it was actually one of the best cons in, in the sense of communicating with creators. Um, and I mentioned uh, getting some independent stuff. I was able to make some room and I picked up this, the Purple Heart, actually because I was in line to get uh, some books signed by Howard Chaikin. And if you know anything about Howard Chaikin, if you've never met him in person, but you've read his stuff or heard kind of things he said or read any of his like posts, especially in his comics, uh, he is exactly what you would think. Uh, the, his, uh, the way he communicates, how vocal he is about things he likes or does not like, he does not hold anything back. He's actually kind of friendly, but it's, it's weird. He's, he has this one of those personalities, he's just, he's just open and honest, but is very kind of welcoming at the same time. It's it's odd. He's a unique person for sure. He seems kind of grumpy, but it, it, maybe he's being jovial. It's an interesting combination for sure, but uh, he's at least entertaining. You can you can, you can at least say that. Uh, but while I was waiting in line, because he talks to people, you know, he, he makes up a conversation. He, he hates it when there's actually a line. He'd rather people just kind of stand around in a circle and ha can have communicate. It's like saying it's more like a bar that way, uh, which in theory sounds great, but then becomes kind of you know chaotic and hectic. And while that was all going on, uh, I was next to this man's uh, panel, uh, uh, his, his actual booth, and he had this comic and I was looking through and I was talking to him. And uh, also his daughter uh, made me this and sold it to me for $2. Uh, and I, I bought it because, you know, why not? Uh, now, but she was raising charity for, uh, money for charity, I believe it was for a charity that was like helping the dog, the animals that were displaced because of the recent floods to you know help them out. So I felt kind of good about doing that. Or she was very happy. And then I realized this is probably the most expensive piece of original art I've ever purchased. So there, there's I don't know what that says about me, but that there is that. But uh, this was a webtoon comic that they made it into an actual physical form. It was kind of cool to pick it up. I've put some money behind some Kickstarter comics recently, and it was kind of cool to actually just be able to pick up the comic rather than having to uh, wait to see if it comes. So I haven't read through it yet. I looked through it, the art looked kind of good. It was only five bucks, which, you know, considering most Kickstarter stuff, it's usually that much plus, you know, it's shipping and handling $10. So I thought it was worth a blind, blind purchase. The guy seemed nice enough as well. And I was able to get, you know, original art. Maybe she'll be a fantastic artist and I'll be worth money someday. Guessing not, but who knows. Um, another uh, independent comic that I got was, this is one actually I was specifically looking for, was uh, Punk Tonko. Uh, 
I got this because I was following the current Kickstarter for Volume 2, uh, and it looked really interesting. Uh, I got this for my son mostly. It's a, it's a, it's a children's book. There's a nice uh, painting, or sorry, a nice image up front in the original artist design, design, and this creator did this with his son as well. And they just started doing Volume 2 Kickstarter, just I think started last week. And he was at Baltimore Comic Con, so I thought I'd take a look, and this would be a good book for my kid that I could read. I read it to him already. He really did enjoy it. It's a little long. Um, actually, I think I might do a video about this in, in more detail for him, uh, at least for a first run through. Then I think eventually he'll get really into it. But it's, it was a very fantastic read. Uh, I'm really happy about getting this. It's a great package. The art's fantastic. It's a really good all ages book. And I'll definitely be picking up volume two. And then when I got that, it also came with, uh, excuse me for a second, this cool sticker. It fell down. That's why I grab it. Uh, also a pin that my son uh, put on immediately on his pajamas and he was probably as happy about the pin as he was or anything else. He was super excited, even more than the sticker. I was surprised he, he picked the pin over the sticker, that the sticker would be the thing he enjoyed more, but hey. And then also um, his wife is a uh, teacher at Yale, I believe. Either, I think it was Yale. And they do these educational comics uh, that, that I got for free. So I was... I, it was very nice of him to kind of give me all that with the actual purchase of the book as well. And then this was on a separate table, but they were giving out these for free. Uh, and I kind of liked the cover of it. So that's kind of why I picked it up. So kind of going into the educational mode. So those were really all the in independent stuff I picked up that weren't like part of the image or anything like that. I'm hoping next year they actually do a small media um, con in this area that's get dedicated solely to that to independent publishers that I'll, I want to go to one year because that way you'll be able to see and read a lot of that stuff as well because that's kind of cool when you be able to the discovery phase of picking something up that you've never seen before or see this guy or girl or what have you that you know has this book that they create and then it takes off and becomes the next big thing that's very cool so I thought I'd go through then some of the books I was able to get signed. Uh, the person I probably actually wanted up, wanted up, went up most to was Jeff Parker. Uh, I went up mainly because he's writing currently the James Bond origin, and I was talking to him about this. And he was he was a very welcoming type of person to talk to. Um, I actually mentioned that uh, I listened to his his interview with iFanboy, and we we're talking about Jaws. So that was a fun conversation. Like that was uh, he talked a lot about that. And he also wrote uh, X-Men First Class, which I didn't know he did this until I was li uh, listening to that interview and they were talking about X-Men First Class. I'm like, oh, I should get a bunch of these signed because I own a ton of these. And to clarify, I, I went up twice. I didn't, because uh, I'm going to go through a lot of books here. I don't like giving a, a creator more than five books to sign um, just because I think it's kind of being greedy. And there, especially the, if there's a line, I know when I was actually getting stuff signed by Dan Slott, there was a guy who legitimately had like, it had to be 60 comics to sign. And I was like, that's just, uh, that's a little aggravating, but uh, some more X-Men First Class. And if you never read X-Men First Class, which actually, I, I don't know if that's where they got the title for the movie from, but it did come out before X-Men First Class, the movie was just retelling are doing other stories within the X-Men First Class universe that weren't told, um, you know, like the hidden stories. It was firstly a first uh, an eight-part miniseries. These are all signed uh, by Jeff Parker. Uh, and then eventually became an ongoing for a while. So uh, it's, let's see down here. It's always interesting seeing where, where they decide to sign. Uh, always trying to pick that place where they they're, they're won't ruin, ruin the art. So it's a great book to like give someone who if you've never read an X-Men book, it's and it's written, I would say, more in a family-friendly type of manner. Um, more, It's not super retro in the way it's written, but I think it's akin to that time without being like overly exp exp like exp expository and like Stanley, where there's a lot of dialogue. It's a good medium of both. And um, but So I would definitely advise picking it up. And then they did a Wolverine first class for a while, which wasn't as good, and then eventually it stopped being published. I'm not sure why. Um, there's some more of it. Like I said, I did not. Uh, sorry for the glare. It's going to be a lot of glare, unfortunately. I did one up twice. <laughs> I just want to make that very clear. Um, so there's a, a lot of these books. And some of these are the ones. This is one he specifically called out because um, he enjoyed working with uh, Nolan and, and, and Allred and a lot of these people. 
Um, he said he said this was one of the favorite books of all the run that he wrote. This was a special that was done like in between the ending of the first series and the beginning of the new one, I believe. I'm not one hundred percent certain, but and and I was actually when I was getting the, this one signed. There was someone there that I was talking to that was one of his friends and I was, it was getting the book signed and he's like i didn't even know you wrote that and he was he was like i was i'm reading that right now i know i know you even wrote it which i'm like that's at least i wasn't the only one he's a friend he's his friend and he didn't even know um i also got stuff signed by ed mcginnis uh some of the hulk books i didn't get as much signed by him he's he's a person who he didn't uh this is what i wanted to show specifically he doesn't charge but he does make you personalize it which i don't mind because i don't sell my books so uh, but he put in this, he put Dan to Daniel, but then he forgot to sign it, which was kind of funny. Um, he, and I remember he was asking me how to say, you know, spell my name, and I'm like, oh, okay. And then I realized that was the first one he did, and he just never actually signed it. So now it just says to Daniel and the handwriting of Emma Guinness, and no actual signature. So, but I, I didn't want to correct him or be like, hey, can you sign this again? I was just like, yeah, what are you going to do? Um, but I also don't really love this Hulk series. I love his art. I, like, I love this cover. But I'm not a huge fan of the actual Hulk series. Um, but I also got him to sign uh, Avengers number one as well, um, which I did enjoy. So he was talking about, uh, I asked him about working with Jason Aaron. He said he's, he's really loving it, but it's, his schedule has been really crazy lately. That's why for a lot of the books he had to get get help, uh, get assistance, why he wasn't drawing them all. Uh, but it was hard to kind of talk to him because he, he was actually a booth with like three other people there. So it was kind of awkward to try to have a conversation. Um, I mentioned meeting Howard Chaikin, and I, uh, I got War is Hell, which is signed by him and Garth Enos. Garth Enos was there, and I wanted to get both of the signed with him and Garth Enos, but unfortunately I, I just didn't get to Garth Enos' table in time before he left, because he was only there for two days. Um, but this is a Max series, back when they were actually doing Max books, uh, and it's a Max series done by Garth Enos that's not Punisher. Uh, it's about this World War One fighter, um, and he's a I think he's in the British, it's been a while since I've read this, we the British Air Force, and about his, you know, comings and going, I think there's a relationship in this, I forget, but I, I, I love World War Two, World War One stories, and World War Two, but specifically World War One because it's, it's so rarely talked about, especially the Air Force of that time, uh, so I was kind of really happy to kind of read this, and it's a book I think that has kind of been forgotten about, unfortunately, um, it being written and drawn, you know, being written by Gar Garth Enos and drawn by Howard Chaikin, uh, but you know, it's in the chicken. I don't think does anything with Marvel anymore. And people actually were having some of the Star Wars stuff th signed by him, <laughs> and he was making fun of them. For he's like, these are terrible. These aren't any good. These are this is your childhood. This is not good. Um, so he's very. <laughs> he'll let you know if he didn't like uh, the book that you were getting signed. He didn't say anything regarding this at all. So I don't know if it's because Enos was there. He didn't. He, but he was very. Uh, he didn't say much. He did say the Blade Run he did. Uh, in the early mid 2000s was like that writer was a, that was one of the best runs he worked on superhero wise so which I find interesting because no one really talks about that run all that much I um, also got some books signed by uh, 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 this one is not one of them um, Sanford Green who does the Power Man and Iron Fist run books uh, he did this with David Walker and it's kind of cool to talk to I was actually talking to him about the new series that he's doing uh Bitterroot with David Walker, which I'm really happy they're kind of getting back together. This was a series that flew under the radar way too much. It was one of Marvel's best books, but I don't know if it was the aesthetic, if it was just because it wasn't what people were looking for, but it really did not perform that well and ended up you know, being canceled. And then uh, David Walker just got caged and it just didn't click, but I, I highly recommend picking up that book. It's, there's really nothing else like it. so. Um, but then I kind of stepped into it because uh, it was, we were talking about Bitter Root and I'm like, he was talking about how like, yeah, there's no other books in in that time frame in the Harlem Renaissance. And I'm like, yeah, the only thing I can think of in, is that came out this year is Incognito. Um, and he's like, I didn't know, I'd never heard of that book. I'm like, oh, it's by Matt Johnson. It's from Dark Horse. And I was like, oh, now I think I, uh, I think I made this much more awkward than I needed to. So there's that. Uh, and then I talked about sitting with Dan, or getting Dan Slott signatures, and I did do that. Um, and I would think, one thing I gotta commend Dan Slott for doing is that when he had that huge pile of books, he's like, does anyone have only a couple to get signed? So anyone who had five and under, he allowed to go ahead, which I was appreciative of because it was near the end of the day. Um, but I got him to sign Fantastic Four number one. And he also talked about, I asked him if Mike Albright will be doing any Fantastic Four stuff because I really loved the work they did on Silver Surfer. And he says that Albright does have a story 
in the Fantastic Four number five. Uh, the the wedding issue. He's uh, Sue Storm is having a flashback to how she was a secret matchmaker between uh, Alicia and and Ben, and that was really the she was the one behind it the entire time. And it's a retro story, so it's done by it's done by Allred. So. Um, which makes me realize, I guess, that wedding issue is going to be an anthology. Um, but, which, again, <laughs> Benningram getting married, I'm hoping it actually happens. But I, I really don't care if it does. Just I just hope it happens so the world doesn't fall apart because another wedding didn't occur and the internet goes crazy. Um, but I had him sign uh, his last issue, and he talked about this, too. And he mentioned that uh, his last story that by Michael Bendis in one of the Marvel summons pitched a very similar story. Uh then to his final story and had to convince Brian Michael Bendis not to actually do that story because it was the final story he was going to do with Mark, Marcus Martin. Um, and then this was one of the first books he did with Marcus Martin that I had him sign. And he mentioned that he's really happy that this character um, that's on this cover actually made it into the video game, um, which I'm like, yeah, that's great. I have no idea. I didn't, I have not played the video game. Unfortunately, don't own a PlayStation. And then I had him sign. I think this is his first issue he did on Spider-Man and then, or at least up there. And then Amazing Spider-Man uh, number 800 and I actually wanted to ask him so I did a video on Spider-Man 800 and he messaged me shortly after because I talked about how it was $10 and $10 is how much you can get for an image for volume one and then shortly after I posted that video it had like five views on it apparently one was Dan Slott because I got a message on Facebook which I didn't think was actually him I thought it was someone pulling a prank but verified it was actually his account saying explaining to me why uh, that's a false equivalency and saying kind of going into the, the stuff behind it so yeah that was that was interesting I was uh, I wanted to bring that up but it was it didn't happen um, and then I also got some stuff signed by uh, Mark Wade uh, that was Captain America number one uh, no not well his number one 695 uh, this was the legacy beginning of the legacy uh, series with him and Chris Sam Samney and I mentioned that this was one of the first books I kind of started collecting again in physical form um, and he mentioned that like he actually doesn't even go to comic book stores anymore himself he does everything digital which I find interesting that you know considering it being Mark Wade I thought Mark Wade would be a person that would always go to you know he's old school but he too is going digital which is weird <laughs> weird, weird to hear I also got him to sign 700 and then um, Doctor Strange number one and then Archie 1941 number one so it's got a, a different mix of, of those books i didn't get a lot of the the classic book signed because there were more in my in my boxes they were harder to find um and then my the last books i got signed were from ed pisker who like his signature is kind of just legitimately just his name so um he also makes you personalize it which i again i don't i don't mind i get it because people will sell it on ebay and stuff like that so um, I was trying to talk to him too about things. I, I will say, like, I feel like when you're talking to him, you're, you're talking to, like, it feels like he's playing a character in a way with the sunglasses and the hat, which he may not be. He, he, he but he was very, again, he was very nice and he was very open and uh, fairly welcoming. It wasn't like he was being like one of those people where it's like he's standoffish, but um, he was just was asking about <laughs> this. He was very forward with. <laughs> I asked him if they were gonna like do a major collection with all of it. And he's like, I don't know, but it's Marvel. They'll, they'll they'll pinch every penny that they can out of it. So I'm like, wow, he's a he's an, even though he's working for Marvel, he still has that independent mindset. And he mentioned that like, yeah, this is what happens when uh, Marvel lets you, lets an independent creator do a book without much editorial oversight. And and I, which is what I assumed what was happening. It was kind of good to get that clarification. So if you're an X Men fan, definitely advise picking this up. And I was going to ask him if he was going to do something like this for the Avengers. And before I got there, he meant the person behind me was like, he said he he can't stand that people think the Avengers are cooler than the X Men, so he made this book because of that. So I'm guessing that means he won't be doing an Avengers book if that's the purpose behind it. All right, enough signature books. Let's get into some some back issues. Speaking of the X Men, I did get some X Men books. I didn't spend uh, these were pretty much all for from the dollar bin or the fifty cent bin, um, but this is uh, X Men Annual number fourteen the end of the Days of Future Present story, which is one I, I will honestly say I've never read, uh, but you see Ahab here, and Ahab's playing a huge part in the, currently in the Extremity series, so I don't know if it'll have any ties to that as well. Um, also picked up Uncanny X-Men number 203. This was the tie-in to the Secret Wars 2 storyline, so just to show that they were always doing these tie-ins, uh, not that's not a new phenomenon, the event stories 
all went through, but the Beyonder uh, with, with Phoenix, so I picked that one up. Um, also Uncanny X-Men number 206. Um, and I didn't have any rhyme or reason of why I picked these up. These were all 50 cents, so I don't have a, like many Uncanny X-Men from this time, so that's really why I picked this up. This one I picked up solely for because of the cover. <laughs> it's Uncanny X-Men uh, number 207 with the Wolverine, which I think might be my one of my favorite Wolverine costumes. The brown, the brown and the yellow, uh, really different. Doesn't really get used all that much more. I haven't seen it in a very long time. Um, and then you have Uncanny X Men number two thirteen, another Wolverine and Sabretooth, and then we have X Men Uncanny X Men number two seventeen, which seems like a very unfair fight right here. The Dazzler versus Juggernaut. Uh, I do like it when Juggernaut's drawn like this, where he's like gigantic. Uh, like not just a big dude but he's like overly huge it reminds me of what he looks like in the uh, Deadpool movie I uh, also have Uncanny X-Men 241 uh, I don't know if this is in reference to Cable because it's Behold the Goblin the, the, the um, Son of the Goblin Queen which is technically Cable uh, but uh, I don't know if it's where this plays into that but it's from the Inferno storyline um, and speaking of X-Men I also got X-Men versus the Avengers no not that one but the first one uh, this X-Men vs. the Avengers, which happened much earlier uh, with a different Avengers team when Magneto was leading the team. Uh, so I've never read this. I've heard, I, I wanted to pick this up. I saw a trade for $5, but then I was able to pick the actual issues up themselves. This is probably the most famous cover from that series is, is, is this. Uh, usually if I see a re reference, it's usually the, this one that's referenced. Um, and then, yeah, this one with Captain America going up against Wolverine, which is always a fun count, or I guess he's not going against Wolverine. He's helping Wolverine in this in, in, in this scenario. Um, and then lastly, issue number four, X Men vs. the Avengers number four. So I'm excited to kind of read that because obviously you know we had that X Men vs. the Avengers series from a few years ago that was huge, gigantic, and that was you know not nearly to that level. Only four issues back then. And then I picked up some classic Captain America books. This is probably the oldest book I got. I think this is from 67 when I put it in CLZ. Um, this was Captain America number 107. This is this is Jan, um, Stan Lee and Jack Kirby. So you were able to get this for 50% off, so it was only five bucks. So I was like, hey, not, I like that cover. You got R.I.P. Bucky in the background. So, uh, you know, I don't own this, realize I don't own anything from Jack Kirby, but I was able to change that this week because uh, I've kind of gone on and off collecting physical copies. I went mostly digital. Now I'm kind of doing a little bit of both. So uh, getting to some more Jack Kirby. But this was later Jack Kirby. I think this is when he came back to Marvel after leaving. Some Captain America and Falcon number 207. Kind of just like that cover. Well, this is definitely Jack Kirby. This is uh, number 214. Again, Captain America and Falcon when there was, you know, the, they changed the name to Captain America and Falcon for some time. Um, and then this isn't Captain America per se, but it has Captain America in it. It's special Marvel edition featuring Captain America and Sergeant Fury. So it's like the, the Marvel presents got kind of mini stories. And then lastly from Captain America, we have uh, an annual. Mainly got this because of the, the cover, but Boom. And sorry again, sorry for the glare, it's really bad. It was kind of funny, I don't know if you can read this. Uh, you can't with the glare, but this guy puts stickers on these books, um, and this says 8.5, like the grade. And it's like, you can't grade books yourself, that's not how that works. But I guess it's just to show the general uh, overall quality of it, but it's not like your official grade has to happen from CGC. I'm like, it's like giving yourself a grade when you're handing in your test for work. It's like, I think this is a 97. It's like, that's not how, the, you have to have someone else grade it. That's how that happens. But hey, if it works, it works. It was only a couple bucks. If it was, some, if, I, if I was actually going to buy an expensive book, I don't think I would utilize the, just that grading. Um, but also got some Avengers books. I got Avengers number 12, which was kind of a cool cover with Hawkeye and I think that's Giant Man. I don't know. It's hard to say. There's so many different characters that grow up big like that. Also, really liked this cover. This um, Jack Kirby cover. Avengers Assemble number... This is 151. Um, mainly got this because, again, the cover, and I don't have a lot of classic Avengers books, 
and I was hoping to do some of the um, from the long box videos on some bigger things more so than stuff that's come out recently or from the 80s so that's kind of a big reason I picked those up and then also from the Avengers I picked some um, Avengers books up that one of the series I'm trying to complete is new Avengers and I have I have most of it but there are pieces of it I don't I didn't have for some reason this I didn't have new Avengers 24 um, also didn't have new Avengers number four this is the first appearance of Maria Hill, Hill as well. Um, when I was, I was worried it was going to be really expensive, but I was able to get it for four bucks. So, which goes to show you, like people make a big deal about first appearance of characters. This is the first appearance of Maria Hill, who is a character that's been a pretty big mainstay in Marvel since she's been created, has been in the movies, and her first appearance is four dollars. So I'm just saying, if you're you know a person that's out there buying comics for you know for whatever reason, don't go crazy buying stuff <laughs> thinking that. You know, something now is going to be, you know, make your college fund later. You know, buy things that are obviously within your price range or because you want to get them. But if you're buying something because you think it's going to return an investment, you know, knowing buying a comic that's $100 now, that might be the most expensive thing it is ever in the history of its existence and may only go down from there. Um, so because you saw that a lot. I saw that, that a little bit at, at the con where people were like talking and they were kind of spouting out like, you know, making money off of these books and things like that. And there's people who can do that, but I think it's a shaky ground a, a little bit. And you kind of, you know, people look at like Batman Damned as like, hey, that cost $100. People are selling it on eBay. That's in like, who knows if that will ever be like that again. <laughs> like that again. So I don't know. I kind of got off a tangent there. Uh, but I still got New Avengers number 16. I, I, I still do really love this run. I haven't reread it in some time, but uh, New Avengers just kind of like that's when I was getting back in the comics from core, and it still kind of holds a special place. Uh, this is New Avengers number 17. Again, this was just me kind of filling in those holes in my collection. And then New Avengers uh, number 18 with Iron Man losing his armor. So I was happy to pick that up. I still have a couple from, I think I'm missing 19 and then like seven or something like that. So it's just really annoying. It's like, I'm so close to picking those up. And there are some leaders in the 50s I'm also missing. I've also picked, picked up some X-Force books uh, from the 90s. Uh, this is X-Force number six. Again, this is just more of a completion thing. So I have a lot of these, but I didn't have number six. And I didn't have uh, X-Force number seven either. So I, I also kind of like that cover. I know Rob Leefield is, you know, People hate on him and, you know, talk about his art. And it's not always the greatest, but I felt this is one of the better examples of his art, but also makes me wonder if this is referencing an another cover I'm just not aware of at this moment in time. But Cable looks a little bit more proportionate in that than his guns don't look, you know, too gigantic. His shoulders are he's clearly bigger than normal, but I don't know. That, I think, is one of the better X-Force covers. I um, also picked up some uh, cl classic... Action Comics, and starting with Action Comics number 481, and I got, I got this because of the cover, because all I could think of is, why does Superman need a plane? Like, why would he need a plane? I hear, we hear about Spider Buggy all the time, um, and like, you know, that was even using like Old Man Logan, but no one ever talks about Superman's plane. Like, Spider Buggy even makes more sense, because yeah, he has webs, but if he gets out of the city, he could use, he could use a Spider Buggy. When would Superman ever need just a plane? Like, he flies. It could punch people. Um, again, I don't know. I, you know. This could be because he lost his powers or something like that. I just thought it was kind of funny. It's a bird. It's a plane. It's supermobile. Um, so, I don't... You know, this was coming out in the 70s. Early 70s? I'm not sure. But, you know, I, I, I know Super, Superman had his ups and downs in popularity. So, he, sometimes he had to do things to try, try, try to bite. So, hey, people sell comics. So, um, also picked up Action Comics number... 419. Um, this was one I got mostly because I really like that cover. So just classic Superman doing Superman stuff. And I don't really own any early action comics at all. Um, really, <laughs> I don't own many DC books. Uh, this is Action Comics number 513. Um, this is where an army or a small uh, a planet of small people land on Superman in space and form a colony. And had me thinking of that issue, uh, the episode of Futurama with Bender, and how uh, <laughs> he ends up becoming a god because people uh, be, end up evolving on him and, and stuff like that. Um, so I don't know if it's in reference to I don't know like to something else, if like Gulliver's Travels or something like that. I'm not sure, 
but it was like, yeah, that's kind of cool. So I'll pick that up. Um, also, got, this is to me was the most '80s cover I've ever seen. This is Lois Lane, um, it, but it's Action Comics number uh, number six sixty two. But oh, Lois Lane learning the secret identity of Superman, and I just looked at that thing, man. That is that is Lois Lane looking like uh, looking super '80s. But this is, came out in nineteen ninety one, so I'm like, man, the '80s were still strong there. Um, but I do actually really like that cover with the the glasses coming down and the reflection. That's actually I think a really uh, when it comes to storytelling a pretty cool cover uh, another one I got was this is Superman Action Comics number 676 again more, mostly a cover purchase I did kind of it looks very modern um, in, in a sense like that I, well, like pretty strong coloring in that as well and I also got it's just because I thought this was kind of funny um, 393 Superman this is just regular Superman uh, where when they nuke Superman this came out in the 80s because hey and I, I was wondering I, I couldn't tell I couldn't match up the time if this was in reference to Quest for Peace or not when he throws all the nuclear weapons in in space or if it was like we hated Superman 4 and this is what we're doing because of it whatever the reasoning I, again I did really like that cover also got this is Superman number 255 um, this is where the sun starts coming going away uh, it was again just this was only I think I got this for a dollar so 50 cents something like that um some of the newer books i picked up uh from back issues i got resident alien um this is a dark horror series and i've read this i don't own it though um and i really enjoyed the, the current resident alien series this is the first volume i think of it um issues one two and three and then there's also a zero issue um resident alien it's, it's a story about this alien that crashes to earth and ends up just having this like normal life um, in I think it's Portland or something I forget exactly, uh, but it ends up being and ends up trying to solve crime and stuff like that. It ends up just becoming a normal person because he's able to make everyone see him just as a normal person. But when he's drawn, he's drawn as an alien. Um, so even though it's like dealing with his alien, it qu quickly gets off that story and becomes more of like a crime adventure with an alien. So it's there's a lot going on with it. It's a it's a fun book. It's one of the one of I think the more underrated titles coming from Dark Horse. Um, I didn't get a lot, of, I got one Spider-Man book and I, it was mostly because I really liked this cover. Um, it was Spider-Man King Annual. So I, I didn't go in with a plan of certain books I wanted to pick up. I just was looking for things and I think things caught my eye and it wasn't that expensive. I ended up buying it. Um, this book I actually kind of got for free because it was uh, in, I got a book, the next book for a dollar. I got this book for a dollar and I was picking it up. I'm like, oh, this feels kind of thick for a Punisher War Journal, which again, I really like that cover uh, book. I'm like, this seems, maybe it's an extra size issue. And so I opened it up and then this was in behind it. So for some reason they put two books in, in one sleeve. So I ended up getting both of them. So I was home by the way, so I couldn't return it and say like, hey, you gave me a free comic, but I would have probably not because it was 50 cents. Um, and then I picked up, this is one again, one of the newer ones I picked up, which is the just the Punisher number one. This is the one that started last year. Um, that's now over, but with Matthew Rosenberg. So I picked it up, number one. I started re with his new series. I actually haven't picked up two yet, but I hope to pick up that soon. All right, well, let's get into the variant covers. Uh, and I, I've, I've never bought in a specific Baltimore Comic-Con variant cover before, because usually it's just a normal cover with Baltimore Comic-Con in the cover. But this was a few, the first one I think I remember seeing where it's like, oh, it's actually, incorporating the city in some way. So I'm like, ah, that's kind of cool, so I'll pick that up. So I picked up Faith Dreamside, number one. I also didn't pick up Faith Dreamside like I wanted to, so it ended up killing two birds with one stone. Um, so this is actually Baltimore Inner Harbor, and behind Faith is the aquarium. Um, but this is obviously not realistic because nothing lives in the harbor because it's so polluted, and those dolphins would probably die very quickly, uh, unfortunately, if they're escaping from the, the harbor. Though they do have dolphins, um, but they don't do a dolphin show anymore. They kind of, they're trying to re, re, uh, re, rehabilitate them to bring them back to the wild, I believe. But anyways, I just like that that was kind of cool that they actually used Baltimore in, uh, in a creative way rather than saying Baltimore 20, you know, 2018 in the corner. Also went to the Valiant panel. And if you go to the Valiant panels, they give you a code word to go down and get a free gold issue. So I got this, which was Faith number one, but this is from the series from last year. Uh, I was kind of disappointed because this was the same one they gave out last year. Uh, they usually have done a different one each year, but 
they so I was like, oh, maybe it's like a cover for Faith Dreamside number one. I'm like, oh no, it's the same Faith Dreams one from last year. So it's specifically gold. It looks just like the normal cover, and I have I have two of these now, and then I also have the uh, actually this one's from two years ago because Exo Man of War was the one from last year. So I don't know, but they're breaking it out again. So I'm not sure. And then when I got that, I also got um, uh, Bloodshot. This is just a preview of Bloodshot that's coming out along with um, some of the other books that they're coming through with the new like Valiant relaunch of some of the titles so and I'm, those look kind of cool so I thought I would, I would pick them up um, some other variant covers that I got I got this one from for World City um, number it's covered up I'm not sure which one it is honestly because it's covered up um, but just I like World City a lot and I kind of like that cover it's very um, of, the, of, the, of the four characters in their youth so I picked that one up and then also got this Royal City cover uh, by Jeff Lemire, which is the Walking Dead variant uh, with uh, done by him with that, those characters, which I, I thought was kind of cool. I know they did these for a bunch of books, but just Jeff Lemire doing zombies kind of got me. And all these variants they had um, actually it was actually the local comic book store not far from here had variant covers, which were six for ten dollars. So it was like, that's a, a really good deal. Um, so, you know. I don't own any physical Royal City, so I thought, hey, I could add those to my pile. I also picked up this one. This is from Marvel Legacy. This is another variant cover. Um, as you can see, the price tag is $80, but I got it for $2, or actually less than that. Um, it, it's actually an okay cover. I don't really love that cover. It's a little busy, and it, it seems a little unfocused for the most part, so maybe that's why no one ended up buying it. Um, so I don't even know if it's really worth that or not, but... I, th I thought it was cool enough with Captain America in the center, but I, I could see like it's not, it does not strike me as like this cover that you would need to get. I also picked up, this is from Avengers number two, but the, I think the one that was done by earlier editions, not the newer Avengers from what I can tell, because this has Sam Wilson and stuff in it. So this is from Avengers from a few, few iterations ago. Also got this one, which is, uh, Deadpool versus uh, Dead, Spider-Man versus Deadpool uh, number one with this variant cover um, which was uh, has a price tag of $100 on it uh, I guess it was from the Monster Quest Unleashed series and I don't know if it's again worth that I looked it up to see and Midtown was selling it for a couple hundred dollars but I don't know like it doesn't I don't I like that cover but like, I don't understand how, who would spend that much money on it so again it's one of those things people might be selling it at that much who knows if anyone's actually buying it uh, that's an, another thing. I also got this variant Power Rangers cover, uh, and mostly just because I liked it. <laughs> this is a you know one hundred percent just a childhood per purchase uh, with all the with some of those orgs. And I think this is a connecting um, cover. They have a few of them, but I only was able to get this one. So, um, and then got another Captain America variant. This is from number one. This is the Adam Hughes cover, and I actually almost bought bought this from my local comic book store. They had it for like 15 bucks and then, and then I was able to get it for much cheaper than that. So I was happy to see that. I do like that cover a good amount. Um, I'm always a sucker for Captain America. And then I got some of the Archer and Fantastic Four variants. So the Invisible Woman. Mr. Fantastic. Human Torch. And Ben Grimm. Yeah. So the, I honestly didn't have any intention of buying those, but seeing the prices on them, I did think they were kind of cool, <laughs> cool to get. So I thought I'd pick them up. And then a couple more. Uh, I picked up this Tony Stark Iron Man number one. Thought that was a pretty solid cover as well, with all the different armors and things like that. So looked pretty cool. And then lastly but not least. I got some of the Infinity Wars. Infinity Wars was a book I haven't been keeping up with, um, but I kind of wanted to, and now I was able to get two of the variant covers for really cheap. So again, only a couple bucks. So I got this variant cover of number one. Um, it says, again, it says $20 on it, but I don't think it's really worth that much. And then uh, this one was one, I think a 150 or something like that, um, which was was number of number two with uh, that new character that was introduced, but then we find out who, who it really is, and then maybe it's not really a new character, but I do really like that cover, actually. So that was one of the variants that I think actually is quite good. I, I did like all those variants, but some more than others. So yeah, uh, I'll, this is the longest video I think I've done of a haul. As you can see, I had a lot of books that I picked up. 
Um, so it was a very successful con for me. Again, I, I try the most expensive book I bought cost me five bucks. So uh, I, I had friends that, that went with me who got much more comics, much better comics. My uh, Chuck, he actually was able to buy the first issue of Days of Future Past. Uh, I went more so uh, quantity over quality uh, this time around. But that may change in in, in future and in, 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 in next time like next year I might just try to pick and choose what I wanted to get. But and this actually was kind of thinking of videos as well of like what are some books I could pick up and do a video of like if I ever got a certain comic that costs like forty or fifty bucks I wouldn't ever really want to take it out of the package because I would just ruin it immediately. But all right, uh, so let me know what you thought of the things I picked up. If you're, you know, what are your favorite cons to go to? Uh, how, how do you typically handle if you do get things signed? The conversations that you've had, you can let me know in the comment section below. I will be doing a normal comic book call as well. This it'll probably be much smaller <laughs> than normal uh, because of Baltimore Comic Con, but that will be coming out this week. Um, uh, hopefully, I might actually have a review of Heroes in Crisis. Or I don't know yet. I wanted to do one, but uh, because of Baltimore Comic Con, things got delayed, and I don't know if anyone has the interest of me talking about that book because I feel like it's already kind of come and gone. So if you do let me know, maybe I will do one. But I do have some graphic thoughts video com coming out because I've been mean, trying to read a lot of graphic novels because next thing, it's already October and it's getting to the point where we're going to start having to put together my top 100 comics of 2018 and there's a lot of books I still need to read. So uh, it's trying to getting down the wire. Unfortunately, only a couple more months left, which is crazy. It's crazy, crazy before 2019. Yeah weird alrighty well that's enough for me just remember comics are for everyone the key is finding the right one until next time thank you so much for watching